Let's take a look at one of the longest running fighter programs ever, the F-5. The Northrop F-5 Freedom Fighter is a small, highly aerodynamic and maneuverable jet, which was built around two compact and high thrust General Electric J-85 engines. The F-5 was designed from the ground up to be an easy to maintain, simple to fly, inexpensive multi-role fighter. With its origins dating back to the 1950s, the F-5 has stood the test of time, and it has become a popular export aircraft while still being used today by the United States as an adversary or aggressor aircraft. Today, we will be taking a look at the first two variants, the F-5A and B, also known as the Freedom Fighter. Here are some specifications for the F-5A. The F-5A has two internally mounted 20mm cannons in the fuselage nose and can also carry two heat-seeking Sidewinder missiles on the wingtips. Additionally, the F-5 has five pylons which can be used to carry up to 6,200 pounds of ordnance or fuel tanks. Loads can include air-to-surface missiles, bombs, unguided rockets, or external fuel tanks. During the Vietnam War, F-5s were evaluated with virtually every weapon system of its time, and pilots, along with forward air controllers, reported that the jets were fast and possessed uncanny accuracy for delivering bombs on target. The choice weapon system during that war was the Mark 117 750-pound bomb, which could destroy just about any target it was tasked with suppressing. By the mid-1950s, the Air Force had developed a pattern of creating bigger, heavier, and more expensive fighter jets. Edgar Schmood, then VP of Engineering for Northrop, decided to reverse that trend. Mr. Schmood was uniquely qualified to do this, having come from North American Aviation, where he designed the legendary P-51 Mustang and F-86 Sabre fighters. To break the trend, he assembled a dream team of engineers. The requirements were daunting produce a fighter that had high performance, enhanced maneuverability, be highly durable, and still be less expensive than contemporary fighters of the time, such as the F-4. On top of this, Schmood also required that the new aircraft have engineered growth potential to allow for upgrades that would extend its service life for over 10 years. This is hard to imagine today, since modern airframes have service lives that are measured in decades but back then, it seemed like aircraft were being replaced every few years, which ultimately would prove to be financially unsustainable. The requirement for design prolonged modular upgrades in an aircraft was a relatively new concept at the time. Key to the success of the new fighter would be its engines. Schmood wanted the latest, most advanced jet engine available at the time, and the General Electric J-85 fit the bill perfectly. The J-85 was developed to fly McDonald's ADM-20 quail decoy, which was small enough to fit in drones and missiles. Additionally, the J-85 also had a thrust-to-weight ratio of 6.25, which was higher than the 4.7 thrust-to-weight ratio found on the F-4's J-79 engines. Keep in mind, this thrust-to-weight ratio measures the engine's weight to its output thrust, so not the weight of the entire aircraft. The chief engineer on Schmood's team was Welko Gassish, who was influential in convincing Schmood that locating the engines inside the fuselage would result in maximum performance. Along with this, Gassich also contributed greatly to the engineered growth potential requirement by introducing the concept of life cycle costs into the process, which ultimately resulted in the F-5's long service life and low operating costs. This was summarized beautifully in an internal Northrop study that stated 
The application of advanced technology was used to provide maximum force effectiveness at minimum cost. The actual design effort officially began from a Navy requirement that a new fighter be developed which would be capable of operating out of smaller escort carriers, as existing fighters were too large and heavy. Northrop's entry into this requirement was given the internal designation N-156, and while the Navy ultimately withdrew its plan for an escort carrier fleet, Northrop continued with their design efforts. Several N-156 variants were considered. The N-156TX had engines mounted in two underwing pods and had a crew of two seated in tandem. The N-156NN was the escort carrier version and was similar to the Grumman F-9F. The N-156T was a two-seat advanced trainer variant, and the N-156F a day fighter version, which proved to be the final design configuration. The N-156T was selected by the Air Force as a replacement trainer for the T-33 in 1956 and in 1959, the N-156T performed its first flight, where it was designated the YT-38 Talon. Over 1,100 Talons would go on to be produced, which ended production in 1972. The Talon is still used today and will be the subject of its own upcoming video. Meanwhile, the N-156F would continue to be developed privately by Northrop and was about to get its first big opportunity. In an effort to contain Soviet expansion, Congress enacted the Military Assistance Program, or MAP. The MAP put out requirements for a low-cost fighter which could be supplied to less developed nations. The N-156F was exactly such an airplane, and in 1958, three prototypes were ordered. In 1959 at Edwards Air Force Base, the first N-156F flew, breaking the sound barrier on its first flight. The testing showed that not only was the N-156F successful, reliability scores were off the charts, and it was even superior in the air-to-ground role as compared to the F-100 Super Sabre. Despite this, interest seemed to dry up by 1960. Interestingly enough, the U.S. Army tested the N-156F for close air support and reconnaissance roles, and although the N-156F proved itself again in testing, the Army could not legally operate fixed-wing aircraft. That distinction belonged to the Air Force. It looked as if the already proven N-156F would fade into history as another hopeful design that was never adopted. However, in 1962, the requirement for a low-cost export fighter was revived. Tensions were mounting in Southeast Asia, and after winning the FX competition, the N-156F was designated the F-5A. Production began that year, and over 620 F-5As were built, along with 200 F-5Bs, which were two-seater trainer versions. Spain built an additional 70 F-5s, while Canada built 240 Generation 1 F-5s. Both were built under license. All told, over 800 F-5As and Bs were built. The first export customer to have F-5s built to their specifications was the Royal Norwegian Air Force. At the same time, the United States Air Force trained pilots and ground crews for customer nations as part of the 4,431st Combat Crew Training School. Additionally, F-5s were deployed to Vietnam to evaluate the aircraft in actual combat conditions. Although the U.S. Air Force did not intend to fully adopt the F-5 in large numbers, the move was seen as a political one to prove the effectiveness of the fighter as an export option to other nations. The Air Force initially selected 12 F-5s for combat testing, and after being modified with aerial refueling equipment, upgraded armor, and instruments, they were designated F-5Cs. The evaluation program was known as Scotia Tiger, and soon this became the F-5Cs nickname. The evaluation lasted six months, where the F-5Cs flew over 2,600 sorties, with only seven aircraft lost to ground fire. The Air Force concluded that the F-5 was an effective ground attack aircraft, its only drawback being its limited range if aerial refueling was not available. Following this evaluation, the Philippines acquired F-5s for their Air Force. By 1967, the South Vietnamese, or Republic of Vietnam Air Force, RVNAF, 
received F-5s, which they used up until the end of the war. Other nations which used the F-5A or B models in their air forces include Taiwan, Iran, Morocco, South Korea, Canada, and the Netherlands. So, what made the fighter nobody initially wanted so good? For starters, the F-5 could operate out of very smaller, unimproved airstrips and was easy to maintain, having been designed from the ground up to be worked on in the field as much as possible. The F-5 produced readiness rates unheard of for its time. Being easy to fly and highly maneuverable in a dogfight also contributed to its success. And lastly, being small, fast, and having two engines made the F-5 a durable ground attack strike aircraft. The F-5 could take surprising amounts of punishment, with one pilot in Vietnam returning to base with 99 holes in his F-5, while another one flew home safety while missing both leading edge flaps. Another factor in the F-5's legacy is the incredible amounts of variants it has spawned. So many, in fact, that they will be the subject of an upcoming video. For now, we can focus on a key feature that would go on to be critical in a future fourth generation fighter. Leading Edge Extensions, or LEX. LEX allows for better control at high angles of attack, which means the aircraft can maneuver at slower airspeeds and still maintain control, which is critical in slow fight and in some dogfighting situations. The production version had a small amount of LEX, and subsequent prototypes increased this, which ultimately led to the design of the YF-17, which became the F-18 Hornet. So what do you think? Is the F-5 an underrated airplane? Should the Air Force have adopted more of them? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and click on the notifications button to see when the next video in this series comes out, where we will take a look at the F5E and F variants, also known as the Tiger. Stay safe everyone, and see you next time.